What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and then turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. Then the water returns again to the rivers and flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. Everything is meaningless, completely meaningless. So what's the purpose? Would you agree with me today that, that there's times in our life when life is difficult? There's times in our life when life is extremely difficult. Now, now don't get me wrong. There, there are moments of happiness. There, there are moments of extreme happiness when we just seem to bubble over with joy. And yet there are also times of extreme pain. T times in which sadness just seem to overwhelm us. It, it's during those times that, that we ask ourselves the question that this gentleman asked. Man, does life even make sense? Is life worth living? What is the purpose of life? It was the American poet Carl Sandburg who said this. He said, life is like an onion. You peel it back one layer at a time and weep as you do. Does that make sense to anybody else but me? There's times as we pull back those, those layers of our life that, that, that life hurts and life is painful and we weep as we go through life. This week we were all shocked by the sudden death of Robin Williams. I'm sure you were as well. Ever since I remember watching him as a child on, on Mork and Mindy. Anybody remember Mork and Mindy? Oh my word, I always thought that he was one of the funniest guys on the planet. Why, Robin Williams seemingly had everything. He, he had wealth. They said he was worth $50 million. He had wealth. He had fame. Why, everybody knew who Robin Williams was. He had a beautiful family. Yet none of those things gave him the happiness and the contentment that he so desperately needed. You see, the simple truth is this. There is nothing in this world that will satisfy our deepest longings. Let me say that again. There is nothing in this world that will satisfy our deepest longings. C.S. Lewis said it this way. He said, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the only explanation is that I have been made for another world. And I'm here to tell you today that you were made not for this world. You were made for another world. And if you, like Robin Williams and like so many others and like even me at times, if, if you sit back and say, come on God, there's got to be more to it than this, we need to realize that there is more to it than this. And God created us not for this life, but God created us for the life to come. Today, we begin a brand new series out of the book of Ecclesiastes. We have simply titled the series Pursuits. You see, there are many people today, believers and non believers alike, who are chasing after the wrong things. You see, many people that you and I run uh, uh, and encounter, run in contact with, and encounter on a weekly basis are chasing after the wrong things. And if I can be so bold this morning, Many of us are chasing after the wrong things. We're pursuing the wrong thing. The writer of Hebrews was extremely guilty of doing the same thing. 
As we walk through this book, and and we're going to walk through all 12 chapters of this book, as we walk through this book, you you will see that the writer of Ecclesiastes experienced everything that this life offers. Why, he had unbelievable knowledge. He had wealth. He had fame. He had sexual freedom and power. Yet he finally came to the conclusion that none of those things produced joy. No amount of wealth, no amount of power or pleasure can give you and I what we crave. Here's what I want you to catch. This is the, this is the whole shebang of the series in one little phrase. Life without Jesus is meaningless. And that's what we're going to see in the book of Ecclesiastes. Life without Jesus is empty. It's void. Life without Jesus is meaningless. And so take your Bibles with me and turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. You maybe have never read Ecclesiastes before. Uh, Go to the book of Psalms and turn right. Psalms, Proverbs, just a few blocks down the road. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. And we're going to start in Ecclesiastes chapter... One, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, I'm going to read the first verse, have a word of prayer, and we're going to dig right in this morning. Ecclesiastes 1.1, 1, 1. these are the words of the preacher. If you have an NLT, it says, these are the words of the teacher, King David's son who ruled in Jerusalem. Would you pause with me for just a second, and, and let's just pray, and you pray in the quietness of your heart, and ask God to take the truth of this, and Apply it to your life as I'm doing the same thing. Father, Lord, we realize that you, were, that you have created us for a purpose. You've created us for a higher purpose. Lord, I know that I am so guilty of, of, uh, of losing focus in my life. Father, I'm so guilty of having an earthly perspective. I'm so guilty of evaluating my life under the sun as if that was everything. And Lord, as we go through this book, I pray that you'd help us not to have just an under-the-sun perspective. But Father, I pray that you'd help us to have a heavenly perspective. Help us to understand the truths of this book as we walk through it. Help us to understand what the writer was trying to say and help us in turn to apply it to our lives. God, help us to realize today that you have saved, that you have created each and every one of us for a purpose, and that purpose is found in Jesus Christ today. We love you in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let me give you a couple of facts about the book of Ecclesiastes as we walk through it. The book's title is found in the very first verse. Now, if your Bible's like mine, you say, wait a second, Brian, the title is found above the first verse. But the title is also found in the first verse. Notice the first verse with me once again. These are the words of the teacher, King David's son who ruled in Jerusalem. The the word or the name Ecclesiastes comes from the Hebrew term koeleth, which is translated preacher, teacher, or professor. And so the idea of this book is that you and I are reading the words of this wise sage. You and I are reading the words of this wise preacher, teacher, or professor who desires to share with us everything that he has learned in his life. And so we need to ask ourselves the question, who then is the writer of Ecclesiastes? He doesn't sign the book. In, in so many other books in the Old Testament or New Testament, the author tells us exactly who he is, but this author doesn't sign the book, but he does give us enough internal evidence to understand who the author is. I say in my notes, the, although many have questioned the book's authorship, there is enough internal evidence to conclude that Solomon is the author. So, so, 
King Solomon was the writer of this book, just as he wrote the book of Proverbs or the majority of the book of Proverbs, and just as he wrote the book of Song of Solomon, this book was written by none other than Solomon. You say, Brian, what is the internal evidence? Well, as I mentioned, even though his name is not found, he uses a double royal title. Notice verse 1 once again. These are the words of the teacher. Then he says two things. King David's son who ruled in Jerusalem. Kind of kind of whittles it down, does it not? Kind of helps us to understand who it was that wrote the book. Jump down to verse 16 of chapter 1 as well. He gives us a little bit further information. He says, I said to myself, look, I am wiser than any of the kings who ruled in Jerusalem before me. And so it's easy as we look at that, and obviously if you know anything about Solomon's life, and you know what Solomon lived and what Solomon experienced, you understand that the book of Ecclesiastes is writing about him. There was no one wealthier than Solomon. There was no one more famous than Solomon. There is no one who experienced the pleasures of this life more than Solomon. The author of this book is Solomon himself. Now, if you've read through the book, you realize that the book of Ecclesiastes is a little dark. As we were talking about it, here's the term we came up with. The book of Ecclesiastes is a little heavy, is it not? It's certainly not one of the happiest books of the Old Testament. There's certain books that as you read them, it seems just to infuse happiness in you. Well, the book of Ecclesiastes isn't one of those books. As a matter of fact, if you don't understand it correctly, you might walk away discouraged, defeated, and dejected thinking, what in the world was Solomon trying to say? Why would Solomon write such a depressing piece of literature? Well, Well, here's what I want you to catch. (coughs) Ecclesiastes is an Old Testament track. You know what a track is? We don't use them very often, but uh, I know Howard does. And and some people keep those tracks that are like gospel presentations. They're just like little pamphlets or little books, and they're tracks that you just kind of hand out. Well, the book of Ecclesiastes is an Old Testament track that examines life Not as it was originally created, but it examines life in its fallen condition. And so Ecclesiastes demonstrates for us, he writes about life, or Solomon writes about life, not as God intended for us to live, but he writes about life in a fallen world. Follow with me today. You see, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, life changed. We know the story, right? When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, life changed. Man who was created in perfection became imperfect. If you've read literature, paradise gained became what? Paradise lost. God had created man in perfection, and yet when Adam and Eve sinned, they lost that perfection. They lost the the state of existence, the state of being that God intended for them and God intended for us to experience. Hey, Hey, here's the truth. I want you to catch this. Sin sucks the joy out of life. Do you get that today? Sin sucks the joy out of life. God intended us for us to have a joyful, happy, wholesome experience. And then what happened? We sinned. And sin entered into the world. And when sin entered into the world, life forever changed. Sin makes life difficult. We understand that because we all have relationship struggles, do we not? We have struggles at work. How many woke up this morning and your body hurt just a little bit? All right? Um, all of us do. My, my nephew, how old's Matthew? Matthew's 22 years old. 22, my, my, my nephew, who's 22, wrote the other day on Facebook and said, why is it every day I wake up and my body hurts? And I'm thinking, good grief, Matt, you're 22 years old. Imagine what's going to happen in 30 years. I mean, we, we all get that. All of that is the result of what? 
It's the result of sin. That, that's not the way God originally intended for us to live. Sin is what makes life so very difficult. Well, the book of Ecclesiastes illustrates that truth. The book of Ecclesiastes talks about what a sinful life experiences. Let me give you one other thought about Ecclesiastes. This book is a testimony of the unsaved, and it's a testimony of the unsurrendered who were chasing after the wrong things. Quite frankly, this book describes many of us. At times in my life, this book describes me. And if I can be so bold, there's times in your life, maybe right now, that this book describes you as well. You see, it's so easy for us to get our priorities messed up. It's so easy for us to make that which is trivial importance and to minimize those things which are really important. As we go through this study, let me challenge you to ask yourself, what am I chasing? Think about that for just a second. What are you pursuing? What are you chasing? And then we ask ourselves, how do I know if I'm pursuing the right things or the wrong things? Here's just a few introspective questions that that I want to give you today. And you think about it. You don't have to answer out loud. Please don't answer out loud. You can write them down. But how do you pass your time? How do you spend the majority of your time? That's a reflection of what is important to you. How do you spend your money? You see, the way we spend our money is a reflection of what is important to us. Here's a great question. Where does Jesus rank on your list of priorities? Is Jesus at the top of the list or is he a little farther down? You might say, hey, Brian, you know what? He's in the top five. Come on, give me some credit. Where does Jesus rank on your list of priorities? That's what Solomon talks about in Ecclesiastes. He talks about those of us that are chasing after the wrong thing and the results of that chase. Well, the passage that we're looking at today, verses 2 through 11, is an overview of the entire book. That's the passage that was read in our bumper today, verses 2 through 11. It kind of gives us a summary of everything that Solomon says throughout. And, and Solomon makes one important point, and that's point number two in your outline. He simply says this, life is monotonous. Life is monotonous. At the very beginning of his, of his treatise, Solomon gives us the book's motto. So begin with me, follow along in verse 2. Notice what he says. I'm going to read it out of the ESV. I like that a little bit better. He says this, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. As a matter of fact, write down in your notes, that's the motto of the book. If you had to summarize the book, Solomon is saying everything in this life is vanity. Let me give you a couple of other translations. If you have the NLT, I know many of you have the NLT. The NLT says it this way. Everything is meaningless, says the teacher. Completely meaningless. The contemporary English version says it this way. Nothing makes sense. Everything is nonsense. The Message Bible says it this way, smoke, it says, nothing but smoke. Here's the idea. The things in this life are elusive. The things in this life are difficult for us to grasp a hold of. If I lit a match today, I wanted to light a match, but I was afraid the, you know, the fire alarms would go off and the fire trucks would come in during the service and would mess up everything, so I didn't want to do that. But, but if I lit a match and then blew it out, there would be smoke. Smoke is difficult to grab a hold of, is it not? Do you ever grab it and say, hey, I got it, I got it, I got it right there? No, you can't grab a hold of smoke. That's the idea that Solomon is making in the passage. The word that he uses means a wisp of vapor, a puff of wind, 
a mere breath, nothing that you and I can get our hands on. He says, life is vanity. Vanity of vanities, everything is meaningless. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> Let's talk about that for a second. So, so I get it. Okay, Brian, life's a puff of smoke. It's a vapor. But what does that mean? Let me give you three things in your outline that it means. The first is this. First of all, that word vanity speaks of the brevity of life. The brevity of life. Life is brief. Life is transitory. It's here for a moment, and then it's gone. It goes by so very quickly. James says it this way in James 4.15. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here for just a little while, and then it's gone. This past Thursday, I had the privilege of, uh, of preaching at Dorothy Chandler's funeral, her her uh, daughter Cindy's down here today. Dorothy was a faithful member of our church. And, and one, of the, one of the things at funerals is just being able to see, you know, they put up on the screen the pictures and you see the family, you see major life events, you see all of those things. And we were able to see the screen as they did that. And on the way home, Vicki and I were talking about the funeral and she just leans over and, and or, or she actually didn't lean over, she said, she'd have leaned over, she would have fell over because there's, there's nothing in between our chairs. But anyways, or our, our car seats. But anyways, she looks at me just out of the blue. She says this. She says, you know that's going to be us soon, don't you? And, and, and I didn't know what she was talking about. I said, what are you talking about? She said, you know that's going to be us soon that they're going to have the funeral service for. And they're going to be showing the pictures of our kids and our grandkids and the events of life. It happens. Life happens so quickly. Can anybody remember what it was like when you were 16 years old? I do. That, that seems like yesterday, does it not? Uh, uh, uh. I mean, that was a long time ago. Life goes by at rapid speed. That's what Solomon is saying. It speaks of the brevity of life. This word speaks of the frailty of life. It's amazing how frail we really are. The strongest and the healthy of us, healthiest of us wither and die. The, the same word that is translated vanity here is found in Psalm 62 in verse 9. Here's what Psalm 62 in verse 9 says. Common people are as worthless as a puff of wind. Same word. And the powerful are not what they appear to be. If you weigh them on the scales together, they are lighter than a breath of air. Same word. They are vanity. They're meaningless. Life is frail. The strong lose their life quickly. The frailty of life. And then he speaks of the futility of life. One translation, maybe your translation says it this way, that second verse, utter futility, it says. Utter futility. The whole thing is futile. Think with me today. If we're not careful, we place so much significance on the things of this life, work responsibilities, little league baseball championships, home fix-up projects, dance recitals, car purchases, politics, professional sports, vacations. We could go on and on. Those are the things that make up our lives, and we act as if those things were the most important things in our life. Yet Solomon says all of those activities are futile. In the light of eternity, they are meaningless. So as we begin the book, he talks about the motto, vanity of vanities, everything is vanity. The, the, the second point that he makes is he talks about a treadmill, all right? I brought a treadmill up here. I'm supposed to get on and run on it. I'm not sure whether I'm a uh, I'm not sure whether I'm going to be able to do that. Can I do that today? Okay, well, what's the purpose of a treadmill? A treadmill is you start walking, but you never really go anywhere, right? Does everybody want to see how good a shape I'm in? I'm not kidding. I can do this. Mark said, Mark said, Dad, can you preach with the... Uh... 
That's actually Vicky's treadmill. It doesn't work on me. I think it knows me and it, it, it kind of locks up on me. But the idea of a treadmill is this. You run, but you never what? You never get anywhere. It, it, it's not like Vicky says, Brian, would you go to the store and pick up something? No problem at all. I'm going to go on the treadmill, Vicky. I'm going to go to the store on the treadmill. You're like, no, that doesn't work. Why? Because the treadmill, you can run as long as you want on the treadmill, but you don't get anywhere. Solomon talks about that in the passage. And he says that, that, that your life and mine is just like a treadmill. Notice verses 3 through 11. Follow along with me. We'll put them up on the screen. He says this, What do people get for all of their hard work under the sun? We'll talk about that phrase in just a second. But notice the, the treadmill of life. Generation comes and generations go. But the earth never changes. Do you ever think about this? Vicki and I think about this sometimes. Uh, I might have morbid thoughts, but sometimes I'll be sitting in our family room and I'll look around and think, boy, someday, Vicki, somebody else is going to be living in this house. Somebody else is going to be driving my car. Well, probably not, because I'm probably going to drive it till it dies. But, 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 but what happens? Generations come and generations go. Yet the earth never changes. Verse 5, the sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and then it turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. Talking about that evaporation process, that evaporation cycle. Then the water returns again to the rivers and flows out again to sea. He gives us three illustrations. He talks about the sun, he talks about the wind, and he talks about the water cycle. And he says all of those cycles demonstrate for us the treadmill of life. Listen, let me give you a couple of things I wrote in my notes. The first is this. Life is filled with cycles that have no end. Life is filled with cycles that have no end. Did you ever wake up this morning? I was up before the sun rose, as many of you probably were. Did you ever wake up and think, oh my word, I'm so worried. And your husband or wife says, what are you worried about? I'm worried whether the sun's going to come up today. I'm just really worried about that. No, we don't have to worry about that. Why? Because every day, what happens? The sun comes up, and every evening, what happens? The sun goes down. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to make it happen. It's happened for thousands of years. Life is filled with cycles that have no end. Notice verse 8, the latter part of 8. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see... We are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are never content. Here's the second thing I wrote down. Life is filled with desires that are never satisfied. Life is filled with desires that are never satisfied. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Most of us are adults here. Is your sexual appetite ever quenched? We know the answer to that. Hey, can you get enough likes on Facebook and Instagram? Doesn't matter how many you get, you're sitting back thinking, oh man, I wish 10 more people would like that. And, and sometimes we post something and you go back to say, boy, I wonder how many people looked at that and how many people liked that. You can never get enough. How much ice cream can you eat at one sitting? <laughs> All right? How much money is enough? It doesn't matter how much we have. It doesn't matter how much we make. It doesn't matter how much we eat. We always want more. Why is that? We're never satisfied. There's nothing in this life that satisfies us. We are never content, is what Solomon says. Notice verses 9 and 10. History merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Sometimes people say, here is something new. But actually, it's old. Nothing is ever truly new. Life is filled with stories that repeat themselves. History 
is about the same stories happening in the lives of different people over and over again. What has happened to you has happened to many people before you. It's new to us. It's novel to us. But it's not new to this world. You're not the first person to get cancer. You're not the first person to get their dream job. You're not the first person to be fired. You're not the first person to be mistreated. You're not the first person to win the lottery or the first person to mess up a relationship. History repeats itself. We live in a society of poor me. And and if we don't get what we want, if we don't get what we think is coming to us, we get upset. As if we're the first person that has ever happened to. And Solomon says, it does not matter what is taking place in your life. History merely repeats itself. It's all been done before. Life is a treadmill. It's filled with cycles. It's filled with desires. It's filled with stories that repeat themselves over and over again. Let me give you another thing in your outline. The, The third bullet point that I wrote there are the lessons. The lessons, because Solomon makes a couple of uh, uh, concluding statements that are powerful. He makes the statement, nothing under the sun is ever new. By the the way, as you read through the book of Ecclesiastes, the phrase under the sun is found 29 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. Once again, you say, Brian, what is it referring to? It's referring to life on this earth. Life under the sun. And once again, let me challenge you with the the fact that we are created to live an above the sun life. And yet so many of us live an under the sun experience. I drew three conclusions from the passage. Let me give them to you quickly. The first is this. Nothing in this life will bring contentment. Nothing in this life will bring contentment. Nothing in this life is new. Now, I know that's, that's a challenge for us because knowledge, they say, is increasing, you know, I mean, so fast, and, and new inventions are coming out. I don't know how many times an invention has come out, and, and we'll be, you know, you know, Vicky and I will be talking or something, an invention comes out, and Vicky will say, I thought of that. I thought of that. I should have invented that. She always said for years that, you know, they need, to put, um, they need to put cough drops on lollipop sticks for kids. I remember when, when, when our kids were real small, Vicky said, I don't, why, I don't know why anybody doesn't put a cough drop on a lollipop stick. Well, they came out with it not long ago, and I'm like, Vicky, come on. You should have done that. We'd be millionaires now. All right? Now, nothing is ever new. This is a tough one. Nothing in this life will be remembered. Notice what he says in verse 11. We don't remember what happened in the past, and in future generations, no one will remember what we are doing now. Now, I know that seems overly bleak, and I certainly don't want to depress you, and we're going to end on a really happy note in just a second, all right? So don't, don't start crying on me right now, all right? Don't get dejected. Don't, don't don't jump in front of the subway as our, as our guy wanted to there in the drama today. But the simple truth is this, that as, as important as we think we are, and as important as the accomplishments that, that we accomplish, as important as we think they are, 50 years from now, 70 years from now, 100 years from now, if the Lord tarries, those will not be remembered. We live for the moment as if eternity did not matter. And as we'll see later on in the book of Ecclesiastes, we were made not for this life. We were made for eternity. Now, I admit that's pretty depressing, isn't it? 
No hope for happiness. No chance for joy, Solomon says. No real purpose in life. We hold on and live out our futile existence until death ends our, min- our misery. And some people think it can't come soon enough. But that certainly is not the message that Solomon intends to give. And it's not the way that we want to end our message today. Yes, life is monotonous, but I want you to catch the third point. The third point is this. Life is meant to be joyful. Somebody ought to say an amen when I say that after such depressing stuff. Who said it? Mike, somebody. Thank you. All right. Let me say it again. Life is meant to be joyful. Life is meant to be joyous. Life is meant to be savored. Life is meant to be experienced. Life is meant to be enjoyed. Let me show you as we conclude today two verses that are polar opposites of each other. As we sit down, we always sit down and we talk through the passage as a team and and we talk through the meaning of the book of Ecclesiastes. We sat back and said, wow, what verse is the polar opposite of what Solomon is describing? And I want to show you two verses that are polar opposites of each other. The first verse is found in our text. It's Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 14. Notice what he says. Here Solomon says, I observed everything going on under the sun. And really, it's all meaningless, like chasing the wind. You ever try to chase the wind? It's like, oh my word, I think it's here, and you race over here, and and, oh, it's coming from over here, and you race over here. Man, you, you can't chase the wind. It's absolutely futile. It's absolutely impossible. It's kind of slippery. It's elusive. You can't grab a hold of it. Hey, hey, here's what Solomon is saying, and I mentioned it at the beginning. Please catch this. If you didn't catch anything else I said, wake up and catch this this morning, okay? Life without Jesus is meaningless. This is what Solomon is saying. And you say, wait a second, Brian, did Solomon understand that Jesus was going to come and was going to live 33 and a half years and then die on the cross for our sins and and rise from the dead and then go up into heaven and then, you know, he, he, he would come back later? I don't think Solomon understood all of that. But Solomon understood that life without God, life without a Redeemer, life with the weight of sin in our life is meaningless. The message of the book of Ecclesiastes is this, life without Jesus is meaningless. It doesn't matter today how much you have accomplished. It doesn't matter today how much money you have made. It doesn't matter how famous you are. It doesn't matter what you've accumulated. Life without Jesus is empty and void. Robin Williams gave us a great testimony of that this last week. Life without Jesus means nothing. Here's a, I want to show you a video clip today. If you're a football player, you're familiar with Tom Brady. Tom Brady, I know he's the enemy. Don't get mad at me, all right? I know he's the enemy. I know we play him in a couple of weeks. Here's, I want you to listen to the clip of Tom Brady, and I want you to hear what Tom Brady says. We don't have it. (laughs) It was really good. I'm telling you, it was really good. It was really good. All right, go home and Google what Tom Brady says. I'm going to summarize it. Tom Brady, he's been interviewed, and he's been interviewed on 60 Minutes. And and the guy on 60 Minutes is asking him, man, Tom, you you're unbelievably successful. One of, if not the best quarterback in the league. You make millions and millions of dollars. You have mansions. You're married to a beautiful supermodel. Life is good. And Tom Brady, in his own words, says this. He says, you know, I have all of that, but there has to be more to life than that. 
There has to be more to life. There is more to life. And he's Jesus. I don't know Tom Brady's spiritual condition, but what Tom Brady needs is what I need. And what Tom Brady needs is what you need. Tom Brady needs Jesus Christ. Because it doesn't matter how much you have, it doesn't matter what you've accomplished. Life without Jesus is meaningless. Let me show you the other verse. Go with me to the Gospel of John. Gospel of John, chapter 10. Gospel of John, chapter 10. I'm going to read, start reading in verse 7 so you can kind of get the gist of what's saying. John 10, 7. So he explained to them, I tell you the truth, Jesus is speaking, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers. But the true sheep did not come, did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. This is a great chapter. It's the I am chapter in which Jesus declares who he is. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. Notice verse 10. That's what I want you to see. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. You see, life kills. Life, our existence destroys, it discourages, it defeats. And Jesus says, I have come to give you something more, something that this world cannot offer you. I have come to give you life and a life more abundant. The New Living Translation says it this way, my purpose is to give them a rich and a satisfying life. Okay, so, so, so here's the message. Life without Jesus is meaningless, but life with Jesus is meaningful. Life with Jesus is meaningful. You see, today, it doesn't matter what you're going through. If you have Jesus, you have all you need. Today, it does not matter if you're being mistreated by others. There's a God in the universe who loves you and will not allow anything to happen to you outside of his will. There's a God in heaven who loves you and he is planning your life. And he wants you to have a rich and a satisfying and an abundant life. Not the life described in the book of Ecclesiastes, but the life described in John chapter 10 and verse 10. Jesus wants to give you happiness. Jesus wants to give you joy. Jesus wants to give you a meaningful life. So here's the question today. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? And when you know him, it doesn't mean all of your problems are going to go away. Come to Jesus, no more problems. That's not his motto. But his motto is this. When you pass through the deep waters, I'll be with you. You see, when when the storms overtake you, you're not by yourself. When you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I am right beside you each and every step of the way. Well, I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. And it doesn't matter what you're going through in life. I want you to have a rich and satisfying and abundant life here, realizing that the best is yet to come. Do you know Jesus today? If not, could we introduce him to you? You say, Brian, I I know of Jesus. I know that the Bible talks about him, but what do you mean when you say, do you know him? Do you have a personal relationship with him? You see, he's come so that you might have a personal relationship. And that begins by you realizing that you can't do anything yourself 
as the team sang a little bit ago, Lord, I need you. And that begins by saying, God, I need you. I confess my sins to you. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. And by faith, I trust Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. That's where it begins. Believers, maybe you've come to the place that you know your sins have been forgiven. But man, you're, you're living an unsurrendered life. And you're chasing after the wrong. They might not even be bad things. But you're chasing after the wrong things and you're unhappy, you're sad, you're angry, you're bitter because you're chasing after the wrong thing. Pursue Jesus. Pursue Jesus. The Bible says this, if you, if you seek me, if you seek me with all of your hearts, you will find if you pursue Jesus, you'll find him.